the trade and investment rules and how it is affecting women's human rights and people's sovereignty, and also to mobilize wider interest and support to join your, our efforts in fundamentally transforming the current dominant macroeconomic structure and policies. And by doing so, safeguard program coordinator of Solidar Solidaritas Parampuan since 2010. Solidaritas Parampuan is a feminist organization based in Jakarta, Indonesia. In Solidaritas Parampuan, Ari plays an active role in strengthening grassroots women and influencing the women's rights agenda, particularly in the context of international trade and corporate capture. She is passionate to bring the voices of grassroots women facing injustice due to corporate greed at the forefront. Second speaker, we have Sanya Reed Smith. Sanya is a legal advisor and senior researcher at Third World Network, where she analyzes the implications of trade and investment agreements on developing and least develop, developed countries. She examines the impact of current negotiations at the World Trade Organization, as well as in free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties. Third World Network is a grouping of organizations and individuals involved in development issues. Its international secretariat is in Malaysia and it has offices in various countries. Third, we have Asra Talat Said. Asra is a founder and an executive director of Roots for Equity Pakistan. Asra has been actively advocating women's human rights in her activist life. She has written and presented extensively on the impact of imperialism and neoliberal globalization on the masses in Pakistan. The flow of our event is like this. We will hear from each speaker, 10 minutes each, and hopefully we will have at least 15 minutes to ask questions, share ideas and perspectives, and then we will wrap up. So without the further ado, let me invite Ari. Ari will give us an overview on systemic barrier, including corporate capture, neoliberal trade and investment in Asian the Pacific and its impact on women. So Ari, you have 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Tan. Good evening, everyone, which is where I am from, Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, to start overview on systemic barrier, which including corporate capture, neoliberal trade and investment in the Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, I think we need to take a look uh, the uncovered failing of system that we have now due to the pandemic of COVID. As I come from a grassroots society, I would be like to highlight experience from the ground that uh, not really much talk in the UMTAD conversations. And actually these narratives also had been spoken within APWLD members uh, in the regions. Given the COVID crisis, uh, the governmental responses to the pandemic for the most part have continued to be driven by the same systemic forces and continue to appear in several countries of the region. Among others are neoliberal programs and policies such as labor law reforms and pursuing free trade agreements, for instance, RCP that enable land and resource capture by corporations and elites. The pandemic coupled with governmental response have hit marginalized communities across every sphere from health to the economy to the impacts on land and natural resources and environment, peace and security and other sphere. The impacts of COVID have been especially hard for women and girls, particularly those that are most vulnerable and marginalized women particularly those who are disabled or from remote rural areas, single and older women staying in isolated places, women migrant workers, stateless and refugee women, internally displaced women, indigenous women, Dalit and other minority women, even uh, women who are staying in crowded small places and LGBTQI plus communities were all more, were all more uh, vulnerable to the impacts of the pandemic. But the business continues as usual. Context of this region in terms of several 
clear patterns of injustice that have emerged in the region over the years, even before the COVID crisis, uh, including rising inequalities, vulnerability to climate crisis, environmental uh, and climate disasters, degradation, a move away from democratic governance, and also violence pulled by fundamentalism and militarism, conflicts over natural resources in the region, increase in women's work and low paid informal sectors of employment and a crisis in multilateralism. All this multi-layered and intersecting crisis trace the need to include and focus on the intersectional inequalities faced by marginalized and excluded uh, groups of women. We may see another indicator of the worsening uh, inequalities, not only between countries, but also uh, between men and women, as well as the effects of unjust, inequitable, and unsustainable development is the increase in depthness particularly of developing countries, which is expected to depend in the coming years owing the pandemic. UNCTAD itself notes uh, over the last 20 years, debt has steadily increased in developing countries. Uh, and the total external debt stocks of developing countries had already reached of like staggering uh, 10 trillion US dollar. Women uh, bear the burn of the rising inequalities globally. Uh, from the Oxfam uh, surveys, women are 4% more likely than men to live in extreme poverty, and this gender gap rises to 8% in Central and South Asia. It is expected that gender poverty gaps will increase as a result of the pandemic in 2021, which is in this year. And in the Asia and the Pacific region, we notice that has long been a significant of geopolitical strategic battleground between the so-called North and South and West and East, and it continues to be a battleground in the so-called US-China uh, rivalry, even as the EU and countries such as the UK, Australia, South Korea, Russia, and other to look to retain and extend their power in the region. China's growing economic influence in the region is underpinned by its massive Belt and Road initiative that was launched in 2013. It is also a party to the recently signed uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, understood to be the largest trade agreement ever struck. And we notice that uh, in this region, it is not only the WTO continues to, prevar to prevaricate of an issue of such fundamental importance during a deadly pandemic, but the region also struggling with other issues, which are the trade and investment agreements. Uh, we know from the civil society and the grassroots movement, the negotiation of trade and investment agreements always doing in the closed door without the, without the transparent, without the, without the meaningful participation of the civil society, particularly for, for, for the grassroots uh, women. Uh, but in the other hand, FTAs provide sweeping powers to foreign investors, including the privileged to sue states in arbitration court system through the investor state dispute settlement. And some of, uh, some of us also call terrorism litigation. Uh, in ISDS tribunals, companies can claim sums in compensation for government action that allegedly damage their investment. Through direct expropriation or indirectly through regulation, the number of ISDS suits have also uh, alarming skyrocket. I must say that the asymmetrical power relations between not only just men and women, but also between countries, between rich and poor, between all of the different multilateral systems as space that currently exists. And we can't really have any kind of gender equality, even though we have a three leaders uh, in the three uh, trade organization in the global level, we can really have those unless there is a broad overarching transformation of our current systems. And that means a structural 
as well as a systemic transformation. And it requires an economic system that puts priority and puts importance on, on women's rights, on gender equality, on our planet and our people over the profit. I will end with that. Thank you so much, Misan. Thank you so much, Ari, and thank you so much for keeping well in your time. Uh, I think you raised quite a several important points about how actually COVID has not created a new problem, but exacerbated the existing deep structural crisis, starting from the unemployment, the health crisis, and also climate crisis, and further deepening the crisis in multilateralism. And despite that crisis, the neoliberal trade and investment rules has progressed within our region, especially in Asia and the Pacific through the RCEP, uh, as well as the expansion of the BRI and the mega investment treaties, as well as, um, you know, keep going with the secrecy of the trade negotiations and cementing the ISDS. And by doing that, actually creating a real barrier to the genuine free trade that should be benefit the people, right, by putting the profit and corporate power at the center of this trade and de development process and the policies. And you also mentioned that how the region and the people are suffering from the increasing debt crisis and the burden, which is well in Ongtad's mandate, as we all know. And you uh, also talked about this is really all fundamentally based on the extremely inequitable and unequal and unjust power relations between and among the countries and between uh, the people uh, rich and poor and between men and women and yes and to tackle that the importance of putting women's human rights gender equality our environment and the planet and people's sovereignty at the center of our conversation so thank you so much ari and i will next invite sanya and uh, you have 10 minutes. And Sanya, I will screen your PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much. And thank you for including us in this important session. Um, so I just wanted to give some updates on some of the current negotiations of e-commerce rules that are happening that can affect women and women workers, um, as well as, of course, they have general implications for privacy and consumers and so on. So um, as you can see on this slide, um, 164 countries are members of the World Trade Organization. And there they have to decide um, in November this year whether to renew a moratorium on tariffs on electronic transmissions. This means um, they have to decide whether they will allow tariffs, taxes on downloading things like uh, ebooks from Amazon or movies from Netflix or songs from iTunes. And there have been a number of studies showing that if countries could impose tariffs on these kinds of things, they could raise a lot of revenue. Um, and those studies are in the link it will give you at the end uh, on the third slide. So they need to decide, for example, um, we know that um, least developed countries, for example, are likely to lose 10 billion US dollars a year if they can't impose tariffs on these electronic transmissions. And we know from UNCTAD studies, for example, that when governments lose revenue because they remove tariffs, then this can lead to cutbacks in social expenditure that disproportionately affect women due to their domestic and reproductive roles and responsibilities. And women are more likely to suffer if essential services are reduced like water, healthcare and education because of a loss of government revenue. And tariffs, uh, when governments remove tariffs, economists have found that it's very hard for developing countries and least developed countries to make back that revenue from other sources. There was a paper by the International Monetary Fund that said it's a 30% that 30% um, of that lost tariff revenue can be made back from other sources if you're a low income country. And it's only slightly more if you're a middle income country. So um, the, all the WTO members, 164 of them, will have to decide um, in the end of November this year whether they're going to renew their ban on imposing tariffs on downloading these things from the internet. Then, um, as you can see, 23 countries are in the process of joining the WTO. And to get into the WTO, they have to get the consent of all the existing WTO members. 
and they often ask them to join optional agreements in that process. For example, to join the optional information technology agreement, which again requires the removal of tariffs, this time on physical IT products that are listed, you know, like uh, computers or mobile phones or computer chips and things like that. And so there's another paper that we give a link to at the end, which shows the impact on revenue of joining these optional information technology agreements, which countries may be required to do in the process of joining the WTO as some have had to do in the past. Um, then in addition, 86 WTO members have chosen to negotiate optional rules on e-commerce. There's no legal mandate for this, but the negotiations are going ahead. And in that they are trying to make permanent that moratorium that I mentioned on tariffs on electronic transmissions, um, where you can't impose tariffs on downloading e-books or movies from Netflix. And they're also proposing everyone in that initiative should join those um, optional WTO plurilateral agreements, the information technology agreements that require the removal of tariffs on physical IT products like computers and phones and things. Um, so that is supposedly an optional agreement, but again, the 23 countries who are in the process of joining the WTO may also be required to join those optional e-commerce rules if they want to get into the WTO. Then on the next slide, you can see that um, there are a number of free trade agreements being negotiated in the Asia Pacific region that also can have e-commerce rules. Some of these have already been agreed, like the intra-ASEAN e-commerce agreement amongst the 10 countries um, in Southeast Asia, and uh, they're now in the process of ratifying that. And that's a little bit weaker than the e-commerce chapter in, say, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP. Singapore has various digital economy agreements. And as you can see there, the CPTPP, which uh, you can see the countries involved in that, um, they're the countries who signed it. Malaysia and Brunei have not yet ratified it. And other countries in the Asia Pacific region may try to join it like China and Thailand and so on. In addition, RCEP, which has already been mentioned and involves the countries you can see, has been concluded and that has an e-commerce chapter. Um, it's been signed and countries are in the process of ratifying that. The e-commerce chapter there is a bit weaker. It's not enforceable, um, unlike the CPTPPs, which is enforceable in kind of the way we assume the WTO one, which will be, which is if you join it and then um, you don't comply, the other governments can sue you at an international tribunal. When you lose, they can put tariffs on your exports until you change your law to comply. And something that we will be similarly enforceable, we expect, is the EU's proposed e-commerce or digital trade chapter with Indonesia and those free trade agreement negotiations which are going on as we speak. Um, they've been happening this year, even in the pandemic. Then the EU ASEAN free trade agreement has been stalled for a while, but if it restarts, that may also have an e-commerce chapter. And South Korea has recently proposed a digital trade agreement with ASEAN. So this doesn't count the kind of existing done deals like the Japan ASEAN, um, sorry, the Japan US uh, digital trade agreement that was done under the Trump administration. This is just some of the live negotiations or where they're still deciding whether to ratify. So um, in a lot of these, they also try to have a permanent and enforceable ban on tariffs on downloading ebooks and movies and so on. Um, then in addition, uh, both in the WTO plurilateral negotiations and the uh, these free trade agreements, they often try to restrict government access to source code or algorithms. So that's, you know, the software that human beings can read. And the problem with this is that there's um, often algorithmic bias or discrimination. So for example, we know that Google shows more ads for chief executive officers to men than to women. We know that Amazon um, had some artificial intelligence to sort through resumes of people who wanted jobs in Amazon. And they penalized resumes that included the word women, like I participated in a women's chess club. Then your resume is downgraded and it downgraded the graduates of two all women colleges. Or for example, if a bank had um, software, an algorithm in its software, which said, only lend to men because they tend to be richer, so they're more likely to repay the loan. So how do you know if there is this kind of discrimination in these algorithms? One of the ways is for any kind of government anti-discrimination commission to check the algorithms or check the source code. But the proposed rules in the plurilateral WTO commerce negotiations and in a number of these free trade agreements like the CPTPP and the EUs and so on say governments cannot check um, source code or algorithms for this or other reasons. Um, so I'm jumping around a bit, but some of the other provisions that can reduce tax revenue and therefore affect women is um, in the WTO 
plurilateral e-commerce negotiations and some of these free trade agreements, they propose cross-border data flows, which says you cannot require a copy of the data to be stored in your country, for example. But we know that countries like New Zealand require a copy of the company's tax records, which are stored on the cloud. So let's say McDonald's operates in New Zealand, they store their tax records on the cloud. Where is this the cloud server for that? that McDonald's uses. For example, if it's in Ireland and the data is not stored in New Zealand, if the New Zealand government wants to check if McDonald's is doing tax evasion, they have to try and get that data back from Ireland. Hopefully they have some mutual legal assistance treaty. It might take three years, they may never get it. So the New Zealand government says that tax records that are stored on the cloud, a copy must be located in New Zealand so they can check for tax evasion. That's not allowed under some of these proposals in the WTO optional e-commerce negotiations or in some of these free trade agreements. And even in the UNCTAD 15 text, they have an agreed paragraph that says, let data flows with trust. So trust is privacy protections, but doesn't have exceptions for tax, for example. So even the UNCTAD 15 text, and I'll put in the Slido um, which paragraph it is, is talking about data flows are fine as long as there's some privacy protections not tax exceptions that might want where you might want to require the tax the data to be stored locally so your tax authorities can check if there's cheating another way that revenue can be lost through these um, e-commerce rules is as i was saying the source code provision um, in the us for example the tax authorities check the software used to prepare tax returns or do tax compliance to see if there's cheating so you can't check that either under some of these e-commerce rules so Basically, the upshot of all this is that there would be less revenue uh, for governments, so less money for public services, which particularly hits women hard, as UNCTAD has noted. In addition, um, the plurilateral e-commerce negotiations at the WTO have even broader proposals. For example, um, they say that retail services must be entirely liberalized. So you must allow foreign supermarkets like Walmart and Tesco's to set up everywhere in your country foreign convenience stores like 7-Eleven, they can all operate 24 hours a day. And um, some studies have been done about what the impact of that would be on, say, um, you know, the informal retail sector like uh, wet markets or fruit and vegetable markets or small local shops. And for example, in India, they predicted that uh, one to five million jobs would be lost in five years if they opened the retail sector like this. And um, in some countries, it's women who are particularly working in the retail sector and in these markets and an in informal sector selling, you know, small amounts of soap on the roadside or fruit and vegetables and so on. And there are also um, in the free trade agreements, some of them also restrict the ability to require local presence. Um, so that would be you couldn't require, for example, Facebook or Google to have an office in your country. So then if they don't, how do you tax them effectively? Who do you send the notice to when they don't pay taxes? Who do you bring to court? If they lose the court case, what assets do you see? So how do you enforce tax laws um, on Uber or Amazon or Google or Airbnb or Facebook if they don't have any um, office or warehouse or something in your country? Um, and so uh, the next slide just shows some of the um, resources that I was talking about in terms of the implications. And just to let you know that um, these agreements, as we currently see them, don't have any exception for gender or um, women or anything like that. Um, so the exceptions for tax are often partial if there are any. The exceptions for health are often difficult to use. So, and there's certainly I've, I've not seen effective exceptions for women to these kinds of proposals. So I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanya. I don't know how to even summarize the information that you shared because I'm now doubting my intellectual capacity a bit, but you know, I think the most important and kind of a shocking information that you shared is how the trade rules are actually binding or disabling the government's capacity to mobilize the natural, uh, national resources, right, domestic resources, through not able to impose tar tariffs or not able to collect taxes to the large multinational corporations with the more liberalized dis digital trade rules, including, you know, the free data flow or <laughs> flow data with trust, and also not able to request the local presence of those um, data hub or the foreign tech tech companies, right? And I think uh, you also raised the important kind of a point that 
for the developing countries to enter into the global structure of trade, while either being a member of WTO or the free trade agreements outside of the WTO, they don't have much power to negotiate for the benefit of, of, of their own development policies, but they have to just surrender them, themselves into the existing or dominant trade rules. And also that is ongoing actually battle within the current UNSA 15 negotiation text, right? Um, and also um, the, the absolute liberalization of the retail services, uh, which doesn't only result in the massive loss of jobs and exp potential exploitation of the labor, but fundamentally erasing the sustainable livelihood of the people that they used to um, enjoy or define for their own life, but it's now totally replaced by something that is coming into our own community, right? So, yeah, thank you so much for raising those points. And I, I really invite questions and any points for uh, further discussion later on when we have 15 minutes to interact. And last but not the least, Asra, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes to share what alternative do we collectively imagine and we want to achieve? The floor is here. Ezra, you're on mute still. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, when uh, Ari and then Sanya were speaking, I was looking and thinking about the women with whom we work on the ground. And I have worked with uh, personally for the last 25 years. And everything that was being said, especially by Sanya, was so far away from women's lives. It seemed like we were talking of the Mars, life on Mars and life of the rural women and life of the women um, who are even part of the urban poor, of the industrial urban poor. And um, I think we cannot bring these two worlds together as they exist um, in any kind of duality. The only way we can bring uh, decency to this world is by eradicating what Sanya was talking about. There is no other way. On one side, and as uh, uh, Misan talked about, that my life has been uh, looking at imperialism. So I cannot actually talk about uh, what we need without talking about imperialism. And imperialism on one hand is, has been the United States and the G7 countries. And now in the past some years, we also are looking at China. And so we have these two monsters who are literally suffocating our very breathing power. We cannot breathe anymore, to be honest. Um, and uh, my, at least, the conviction I have through the, the many movements we have worked in solidarity with, whether it is the women's movement within the APWLD structure, whether it is the women's movement in the International Women's Alliance structure, or it is the women's movement and the peasant movements in my country. The only way to go forward and to look for a, uh, to regain our lives as, as human beings, and not as cattle, not as animals, not as uh, slaves, is to organize in very large numbers and tackle these huge corporations who are, uh, uh, you know, coming down on us. And so, for uh, for for many of the feminists and for APWLD, we have always talked about um, five hands of what feminist justice is all about. It is about distributive justice, it is about uh, ending patriarchy, it's about actually coming back to gender and social justice, and it is about uh, accountable for people. All of this means one thing to me, when I talk about a, a world which is ruled by the people, by the women of this world, it starts from the very basics. As, as human rights defenders, we have been taught that the basic rights of humans our shelter, first of all, right to life. And patriarchy actually has taken uh, that right away from women at 
at, at many different levels. Uh, when you when you combine feudalism with patriarchy with capitalism, we have no life. And so, for us, um, the very basic right of life, of shelter, of water, of health, of uh, nutritious food, I will not say food, I will say nutritious food uh, of education. None of this, and this is what is needed at the ground level for the millions, billions of people existing on this planet, which the COVID-19 has shown very clearly that the system has failed us. Um, and I will not mention IPRs, the TRIPS agreement, the ISTD agreement, all of those agreements which are just for most women on this world, in this world, those names have no meaning. Uh, for us who are fighting for decent livelihood, our world rotates around ensuring control over our productive resources. Whether it is a very small farmer, a landless woman, all she wants is land where she can grow food and keep her livestock and grow food for her, for her family. And so to me, when we talk about feminist justice, to me, the number one point of feminist justice is to ensure that the women and the people have control over land and reproductive resources, productive resources hinge to land. The second is industrial development. Yes, we need industrial development. Yes, we need to build all the technologies that are needed uh, to live a life of equity, of justice, of the needs that we have like COVID-19 vaccine or any of the vaccines or any of the medicines that are looming uh, given the kind of crisis that we are living in. Those are things we need. It's not like we want to go back to living in the caves. You're not talking about like being backward in whom we are. We want advanced technology. But advanced technology, which is in the hands of the people, we are the ones who own that technology. We are the ones who use that technology and we use it based on our needs. When everybody talks about digital economy, it makes me so angry. You know, I just heard this a few uh, weeks ago, or maybe 10 days ago, that China has put a limit to the use of digital technology on children. That children can only use uh, electronic stuff for so many hours per week. But we, our children, and I'm being very serious, our children, all of them are using, even people, children in the poor households have these really, uh, these devices where they are on these things and we have no sense of rationality how to use these technologies to benefit education of our children. So to me, it is critical when we talk about alternate systems of justice, number one, distributive justice. The wealth of this world belongs to the people, to the labor class, to the working class, to the, to the farmers, to the fisher folk, to the indigenous people. That's where the wealth has to go. That's number one. And when it goes to the people, then we have to make sure it goes to the women as well. It's not that all the men take over control over the resources and we don't have control over it. That is number one. That is the most critical part of bringing equity to this world. Without control over the resources that are needed to give us health, education, clean water, clean environment, none of this is possible without having control over reproductive. Sources. And to me, all of this is a dream until and unless we mobilize, we organize and mobilize. So to me, a fair world is a world where we have politicized our men and women and everybody in between and the children and the youth and the elderly to say that no, uh, as it says, if it has to be total stop to capitalism total stop to feudalism. I will just give you an example. You know, I, there, was a climate, there was a climate disaster in Pakistan and we were visiting communities to find out how they're coping. And we went into a woman's household. She had nobody in the house, an old elderly woman and a woman, uh, her daughter, who was in her 20s or 30s, and she was not well. She had psychiatric problems. So they could not go out to collect wood to burn fuel for their food. You know what that elderly woman had done? She had 
bought a very small uh, goat, a kid, I think that's what they're called. And she was using the manure from the goat to burn fuel for her kitchen. It taught me a lot. This was many years ago, but it taught me that it is the people, the women who know how to survive in the direst of circumstances. And unless we put forward the decision-making of how we want to run our communities in justice, in equity, in, hum in humanity, we, it is the women, it is the elderly, it is the people who need to sit down and say, this is what we need. When everybody is talking about you know, trade and digital technology and God knows what not. And when I walk into these rural communities, they don't have water, literally no water. There is no electricity. If there is electricity, you go into a rural woman's house, she would have shut off her fan. And you ask her, you know, when you walk in, they will put the fan on. And we, it, it surprised me a few times. What are they doing? Every time I walk in, they open the fan. And then I realized, even if there is electricity, they don't have the money to pay for the electricity bill. That is the World Bank. That is the IMF right there. When they talk about bringing technology to us, we have no decent livelihood to pay for that technology. And so the most, after having control over our resources, the most critical aspect of our lives is to ensure that our livelihoods are decent livelihoods. What we earn, irrespective of our, uh, of our education, is enough to get us food and shelter and health and education for ourselves and our children. We have made a disconnect between what we earn and what are the basic necessities we need to live as humans on this earth. That disconnect, this is the dialogue of the 70s when the governments were still reeling under the impact of socialist revolutions and communist revolutions. And everybody was talking about basic health rights, basic rights, which was life, shelter, water, health and education. And today, Almost 50 years later, with COVID-19 as a constant um, suicidal knot around our necks, we understand the critical importance of health, the critical importance of nutrition. You know, every time anybody had COVID in our communities, the first thing people would say, have an egg every day, make sure you have nuts. You know, we have these uh, like walnut, like pistachio and all that. Make sure you have these nuts for your meal every day. Make sure you have honey every day. Make sure you have milk every day. This is the nutrition we need. How many of us can afford this? We cannot. So all this trade deal about countries running into our lands, occupying our lands, all this conflict in Palestine, in Kashmir, in Afghanistan, what is it all about? It's not about distributive justice. It's not about equity. It's not about women and men to be equal. With all the nonsense about women in Afghanistan facing the Taliban, you know, the planes which left Afghanistan one after the other were crammed with men. On Twitter, they were showing pictures of these people who were sitting inside these planes sitting on the floor. And I, I kind of checked all the rows of people who were sitting and it was all men. If it was women who are at risk from the Taliban, why were all the men running away? So to me, um, it's very simple. I don't think it's a very complex formula for me. What will a, 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 a sane world, a, what will a humane world be uh, if we have control? Number one, we are the first to make decisions especially the women. I find when there are women, because women don't make decisions for themselves. Women always make decisions for the community. They will think of what the elderly need. They will think of what the children need. They will think of what their husbands and their brothers and their, everybody, everybody, because they are the center of a household. They are center of a community. So first and foremost, decision-making with the women. Second, control over productive uh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, one minute to wrap up. I'm sorry. sorry. So I will just summarizing decision making, control over productive resources, and the basic necessities of life 
have to be made free of cost. This is not a bloody marketplace that we are living in. We are living in communities and societies. And we need to empower, we need to mobilize everybody out there to go and get rid of the capitalist, the feudalist uh, from our countries internally and externally. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Asra. I think, yeah, I think Asra, you raised some key recommendations and some key elements of how alternative economy might look like based on the realities that women, especially and other marginalized communities face, um, especially in the global south, uh, in Asia and the Pacific. And those, as you outlined, distributive justice, right? And then access and control over productive resources and the fundamental human rights and the right to live life with dignity and um, decent livelihood. And to enable that, there needs to be a decision-making power that is uh, lying with the people and the fact that the sovereignty comes from the people and especially the power of women um, that has to be at the center of the policies and decision-making. Um, I think we have around maybe 15 minutes for Q&A, and I'm just checking whether we have any questions uh, coming from the participants or what those who are watching our side event. Um, and yeah, those who have a questions uh, to our panelists, you have to put your questions using Slido. Uh, and we are monitoring that to collect some of the questions while um, we wait for those questions to come in. Uh, maybe uh, one second. Okay, I received the questions. So I'll read it out. It's, and then I will ask panelists to respond to this. Um, so understanding a huge missing of the women and grassroots voices in trade negotiation and relevant spaces of making trade policy, what are your recommendations to civil society to amplify these voices of women, grassroots women, and what UNCTAD can do to bridge or close this gap? I think this question can go to all three panelists, um, but I might maybe start with Ari, if that is okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you for the question. Actually, it is a quite difficult uh, question because of uh, from our experience in engaging with the trade negotiations, uh, it's been very closed door and uh, the, 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 do the document itself uh, cannot be accessed for a lot of uh, people. Uh, but, uh, and the other things is uh, actually what uh, what all, what already Azra mentioned is about uh, the whole things on the text negotiations are not in the very uh, grassroots realities uh, are not in the very realities at the as, at the grassroots level. So uh, we need to we need to like contextualize uh, between the the you know the text with which are very specific very you know like a very detailed and we know that uh, the legal text always the details are on the details because of uh, the details itself really uh, ruling our lives and impacting our life uh, it needs to contextualize with the 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 life of the people at the grassroots level. And then it is uh, also important to bring the angerness, the, the, the things that can really threaten our life uh, to the negotiations room, actually. That is the challenge. And I think uh, we need to take a look at some of uh, recommendation from the UN agencies or the UN uh, experts uh, to 
I don't know. I, my I myself not really uh, not really sure about it, but there are some recommendations to take a look at the women's rights impact assessment before a country uh, signing a trade agreements or like um, maybe having uh, an impact assessment uh, and you know like uh, making a, a plan to you know like uh, evaluating what actually happened with the previous trade agreement that already signed and not taking another trade agreements uh, before we know what is uh, what is really impact to the people's life or what is is it really benefiting our countries or uh, make the situation are worse i think that uh, that is from my uh, my sides misan thank you very much ari um any other panelists who wants to share review sanya uh, thank you very much and for that question so um Today, I only focused on the implications of the e-commerce rules that are being negotiated on women, but other trade rules that are being negotiated at the World Trade Organization or in free trade agreements in the Asia Pacific can also affect women, including grassroots women in other ways. For example, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is predicted to cause ASEAN to lose 3.8 billion US dollars in tariff revenue per year if it's ratified. So how many COVID vaccines could that buy? How many medicines could that pay for? How many nurses salaries could that pay for? that money is gone permanently doesn't come back according to a study using world bank methodology which i'll put in the slido um, then of course in the wto uh, in terms of how public these negotiations are in the wto some texts have been made public for example they are negotiating uh, to restrict fishery subsidies and in many countries in the asia pacific fisher folk are the poorest of the poor so if their governments cannot subsidize them then that's even worse for poverty and livelihoods um, those texts are made public from time to time, but the WTO plurilateral texts like on e-commerce, investment facilitation, services, domestic regulation, disciplines, and so on are generally not made public. And then except for the EU, most of the free trade agreement proposals are not made public. And of course, these negotiations occur between governments behind closed doors um, without CSOs being present. But it doesn't inherently have to be that way. For example, the same intellectual property rules when negotiated at the World Intellectual Property Organization, CSOs can go, they can listen, they can speak after the governments, they can get the negotiating text. There's nothing that has to be inherently secret about these um, trade negotiations. Um, and then I should just clarify the local presence thing that I mentioned that you can't require the companies to have local presence. That's on a negative list basis in the CPTPP and RCEP. So you can only require, say, Amazon or Google to have an office that you could then tax them if you got an exemption for that sector. All the other sectors you cannot. But free trade agreements like the CPTPP also allow foreigners to buy as much land as they want, including farmland in the countries involved. And the foreigners can take as much fish as they want from your country's seas, unless you get an exception for fishing and land ownership. And you have to negotiate that exception. So in terms of how does it affect grassroots women, it affects grassroots women in terms of land ownership, in terms of their ability to have any fish left in their sea. And of course, the CPTPP also restricts fishery subsidies to the countries involved. And then as you people were talking about the implications of the intellectual property provisions on medicines and the failure of the EU, Britain and Switzerland to agree to the COVID trips waiver in the WTO is meaning that there's a shortage of COVID vaccines, medicines to treat those infected with COVID, test kits, ventilators and so on. But um, the developed countries are not satisfied with that. In free trade agreements, they ask for even longer, stronger monopolies on medicines. So uh, this is in the European Free Trade Association agreement. Um, Free trade agreements, that's the Switzerland, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. They're currently negotiating, I think, with India, Malaysia, and is it still Vietnam? Um, and then the EU free trade agreements, for example, the EU has proposed to Indonesia during the pandemic that Indonesia must give them longer patents on medicines, so a monopoly longer than 20 years, a monopoly on medicines even when there is no patent, and a monopoly on seeds for 20 to 25 years that a study found that in the Philippines would cause seeds to be more than four times more expensive. And this provision is also in the CPTPP. The EU has also made proposals to Indonesia that could prevent the Indonesian government from setting affordable prices for water, electricity, internet, public transport, gas, hospital treatment. So these are some of the other implications of other free trade agreement chapters that may have implications on grassroots women. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sanya. Whenever we hear you with a very concrete examples and so easy to understand, it's just such a 
privilege that we can have and making the trade agreements and article negotiations so easy and close to our reality. So thank you so much for that. While um, there is a very specific question to Azra. So Azra on the need for technology, but when it's provided, there is a lack of money or resources for to one, pay for the technology and two, to access these technologies, right? So how do you believe these educational systems can be best put in place to sensitize and utilize this technology to benefit the communities? Um, to be very honest, in the current mode where everything is for profit and these technologies are controlled by profit, entities, for-profit entities, they cannot be put to any good use. Um, and I am talking from the very uh, basic communities, the rural communities, the urban poor. Uh, the sensitization, to me, the most critical aspect of um, getting anything useful in the hands of the communities comes from physical mobilization, number one. It's a question of decolonizing our minds. At the moment, our communities have been colonized in the real sense and neo-colonized after the trade agreements. And so uh, the whole context of these technologies in rural communities, in urban communities, is to hold that technology not for political motivation, not for educational purposes, but as a status symbol or as to what, you know, things which are very common in the mainstream, whether it is song or movies or that. So all of this, the technologies are critical um, only when we have politically conscious communities. And so uh, how can these technologies can be put to best use um, you're talking as if the, the communities are already politicized. If there is a community who is politicized, these uh, technologies, whether it is Twitter or whether it is social media of any kind, is amazing. I, I find that once we are politicized, we can really, really use these technologies to immediately grasp what is happening in the world out there or to start mobilizing our people internally, either way to connect with the outer world or the inner world. But then I'm talking about politically mobilized <clears throat> groups. Uh, it, is a, it is a very powerful, and I use the word weapon because it is a weapon uh, for our communities. Um, yesterday, there were eight people who were arrested in front in Jakarta because they were protesting the United Nations Food System Summit. And I think there was so much mobilization across the world there were hundreds and thousands of people on different uh, these uh, Wi-Fi gadgets. And we heard within some hours that they're out. And so that is the power of these technologies. Uh, in, terms of in terms of real education, it has to be free uh, access to these technologies. We were having a, a four-day training with uh, farmers, landless and small farmers here just now. I just finished a few hours ago, and we were talking about that unless and un, when TV came, when TV became uh, common across the continents, uh, everybody was saying now everybody will be literate, people will be able to get education, because you can have classrooms on TV. And because the, the political will for doing that was absent, it was useless. And today, post COVID, all of us have gone on Zoom to hold school uh, classes, you know? Um, and so, but again, in families where there are three kids, there are two kids, there's only one computer, how can they be educated? The classes are running at the same time. There are two children who have to be in that online class. It's not possible. Which family can have two computers to just give the children to have classes? And if the mother is not educated, she has no idea of how to help that child with that technology. So all this technology is very, very, very far away from the reality of the communities. And to me, 
it's a political asset when we have politically mobilized um, communities, as I said. But when they are, when they are not, when there is patriarchy, deep patriarchy, and a majority of the women have never held a gadget to edu to for educational purposes, it's more of a burden. You know, I in so many households across my country, women are so exhausted because it is the morning hours when schools are running and they have two kids sitting online and they have to make sure the kids are paying attention to what is happening on the screen. They have to cook at the same time. They have to look after the house at the same time. If they have an elderly person in the house, they just can't cope. So I, I, I'm very sorry, but these questions um, really are meant for politically conscious, mobilized uh, communities, not for the mainstream we are trying to protect. I would like to address, if I may, I don't know how much time I have, Hein. May I address the other question also? Yes, Astra, maybe I was going to type, but because you have to maybe leave a bit earlier than other panelists by a few minutes. So just going back to the original mandate of the UNGTAD, right? So UNGTAD is a primary um, body or space within UN to talk about the trade and development policies and related issues. Uh, and then the original ideology of establishing UNCTAD was to help the developing countries uh, to have their sustainable trade and development policies and dismantle as much as possible the disparities and inequalities and imagine a new economic international economic order. But now at the current state, the UNCTAD seems to be at risk especially also their independence being threatened. So there is a two questions in one. So one, maybe this can be specific to Sanya, that what is the one thing that we can focus and prioritize to keep the original mandate of UNCTAD stronger based on what's happening in the current negotiations, because we see the clash between the EU developed countries and G77 in many specific elements of the negotiation text. And then the, the other element of this question is, what is one key demand you have uh, to achieve a just and feminist and equitable economic order. I hope you're not losing Astra with our internet connectivity, but yeah, this one key demand or recommendation for a more just economic policy and structure uh, is to maybe Astra first and Ari, uh, if Astra has to leave a bit earlier. Or, um, so what is the question? The last question is? <laughs> the last question is, what is the one demand or suggestion, recommendation from you to transform the economic structure, right? Yeah, and then in relation, especially to the role of OMTAT. Um, For me, it's very easy, uh, Misan, get rid of private property. You know, uh, if you can get rid of private property um, and we can go to a system where the government is responsible for providing the basic needs of society um, and making sure that the production uh, systems are hinged to produce for the needs of the local communities, whether it is food or clothing or education or health. So if my community is suffering from uh, infectious diseases like malaria and uh, you know, the infectious, the uh, tuberculosis, the infectious diseases which are still rampant in, in our communities, then the healthcare system and the, and the pharmaceutical system should address those needs which are prevalent in the community at the highest level, not the kind of health needs that are relevant to the rich and the affluent parts of my economy, or as you said, outside my economy. That is how the system is running at this point. The educational needs of our children, of the children in Pakistan, is that there should be excellent primary schools available to them. And we have very good universities now, but our public private, uh, our public primary system is has gone to the dogs. 
So how can we have a very big educated society when there is no public primary school system present? So everything that we produce, whether it is education or health or food or all kinds of technologies have to first benefit the people who live in that country, who live in that local region, not somebody else in Japan or the United States or China. It has to be the people of Pakistan or the people of uh, Indonesia or the people of Malaysia. We cannot keep on producing for the needs of the other countries and not for our own. That is the key. Get rid of private property. Make sure that there are centralized state governments providing to the needs of the people. And I think we can solve the problem. The problem, although, is really based on people's ability to push uh, power away and take the power themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chasra. Um, should I go to Ari or Sanya? Ari, Slakan. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Uh... It is important uh, for us, uh, particularly from developing countries or from uh, least, developed con least developing countries to strengthen UNCTAD mandate because of, you know, the current situation uh, due to, to a lot of crisis, uh, climate crisis, uh, COVID crisis, and all of the crises uh, are interlinked uh, and we really require that UNCTAD should be, and maybe can be balancing uh, the asymmetric uh, power between uh, rich and poor countries, and also uh, the asymmetrical uh, power that I already mentioned in the earlier uh, discussion. Uh, because we think that until now we still have uh, some of critical analysis from different perspective uh, for instance the last uh, the last uh, the last things uh, from ongtat about the rcp that it can really make our government to rethinking again about uh, benefit to join with the rcp even though finally they are still joining in uh, but i think those of things uh, are crucial uh, for uh, for people from uh, from uh, developing country or from the yeah from indonesia and from uh, countries in the asia and the pacific ones i think Thank you very much, Ari and Sanya. Uh, yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, so I guess uh, one thing is that the UNCTAD should do no harm. So for example, I, I was concerned to see that um, some the UNCTAD E-Trade Readiness Assessment that they do for some countries like Tanzania, which is a least developed country, said consider establishing a de minimis import value of 100 US dollars. That means everything that's less than 100 US dollars could have no tariffs imposed on it and maybe no other taxes either like value added tax. So this would mean that Tanzania, a least developed country, would permanently lose significant tariff revenue. And then those, those imports could compete with local farmers. So for example, how much skim milk power can you import with $99 at a time in different packages that then compete with local Tanzanian dairy farmers, the same for manufacturers and so on. But this was an UNCTAD suggestion. So I would hope that UNCTAD could be focused on what helps developing countries and least developed countries and that the consensus building and technical cooperation chapters uh, pillars of UNCTAD should be based on the um, outcomes and evidence identified by the research and analysis pillar because there's a lot of very useful research and analysis done by UNCTAD in terms of debt and finance um, south south cooperation and so on uh, which is very valuable and is not available in other institutions um, and so we, we really value that um, and we would hope that UNCTAD's work does not undermine the ability of developing countries and least developed countries to develop. So I put in the Slido question and answer some links to letters by um, various civil society organizations on UNCTAD and the current uh, mandate that's being negotiated. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sanya, Ari, and Asra, and all of you who joined our site event. Again, a reminder, please go to Slido and then check the links out that Sanya has just shared to read more and know more about um, the CSO positions and then the data flow and RSF study in particular. And uh, to just to wrap up our site event, the title was the solidarity and the system change is the only answer. Um, and I think what we know very clear is that the current structure and system is rotten, right? And it is only getting fueled and getting fastly consolidated to further the neoliberal imperialist agenda. And Azra has mentioned that the only way is not to surrender ourselves to that neoliberal ideology that is so infiltrated in, in every layers of our society, even in our education system, right? And for that to happen is to be vigilant in political education and knowing what is happening and what these um, technical articles in real means to women. And this means that we have to in, increase and enhance our solidarity, not only within the movements, but those people who have been doing also excellent work, including research, uh, researches. And then those people like Sanya, who has brilliant understanding and information and knowledge on the trade negotiations and unpacking that into the reality of the people on the ground. So that solidarity building is something that we have to be very nimble in doing so, as well as to safeguard the UNCTAD in its original mandate. And again, a point of solidarity building that was there when UNCTAD was initially being set up, the solidarity, the South-South solidarity, especially the nation countries and the people solidarity from the South and that collective solidarity needs must be there so that we don't um, lose this momentum and then uh, not able to even respond right because um, of this immense power that is spearheading whatever happening in the neoliberal agenda so yeah so Sanya has been sharing the links uh, to the Zoom link as well as the Slido. So please go back to the Slido. And then I think the side event was uh, live stream on APWLD's YouTube as well. So please um, revisit it if you are interested. So thank you very much once again, Ari, Azra, and Sanya. And we will continue our work together. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care, Azra. Thanks for organizing. Hi, thank you. Um, hello and welcome to this side event on how to build a just recovery from COVID. My name is Sam and I'm from Friends of the Earth International, one of the largest grassroots environmental organizations in the world with over 2 million members on, uh, in 73 countries. The political, economic and social response to the COVID pandemic will shape our world over the next decade. We've seen an estimated between five and 15 million people die. Hundreds of millions of people have got sick, cities shut down, health systems collapse, economies ground to a halt, trillions of dollars um, spent in, from governments. And we've seen both incredible acts of solidarity and heartbreaking greed. This is a mo major moment um, of change and transformation uh, when the UNCTAD 15 conference is happening. Across the world, movements and some governments are uh, campaigning and building a just recovery, be it a solidarity food network in Brazil, uh, stopping fossil fuel bailouts in the US, new economic models, or supporting indigenous land management. In this side event here at the CSO UNCTAD Forum, uh, we hope to learn some policies and strategies on how to demand and campaign for a just recovery. It'll be a space to increase our understanding of just recovery principles and help to build the global movement for a just recovery. For us um, at Friends of the Earth, which is the organization I'm from, um, a just a recovery doesn't mean going back to normal. It means that it's time to prioritize justice, sustainability, human rights, um, and to protect our livelihoods in the planet. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis is a result 
of a system that prioritizes profits over people and the environment. And it's a systemic and interrelated crisis as we face, be it environmental, social, democratic and health crises often share the same root cause, a neoliberal patriarchal and unequal system that must be addressed through a just recovery. We've got three uh, incredible speakers today. We've got Dipti Batahanga from Friends of the Earth International and she's based in Mozambique, who will be speaking about a, just, a recently released uh, Just Recovery Renewable Energy Plan for Africa. Uh, we have Katie Golio Swan, who's a policy coordinator at the joint, uh, a joint project between the Boston University Global Development Policy Center and UNCTAD, working on supporting a green and just transition. And Leti Parahanos, um, who'll be discussing the feminist just recovery from the Brazilian context. And she's working with social movements from the La Alianza Feminista Popular, uh, Friends of the Earth and other movements like MTST. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna ask Dipti to start. Thank you very much, Dipti. Thank you, Sam. Uh, hi, everyone. Happy to be in this panel. I'm going to share my screen, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, so I'm Dipti, as Sam said, from Friends of the Earth International and Justice Ambiental in Mozambique. And we released a report uh, three weeks ago on the 1st of September uh, that fits really well with this theme of how do we build a just recovery in the time of this COVID crisis. So I want to start by talking about, let me know if my slides are not moving, Sam, but you should be able to see the crisis slide now. So of course we're facing a pandemic and this COVID-19 crisis, we're facing a climate crisis, but those aren't the only crises that we're facing as a world, and especially on this continent. Uh, of course, the climate crisis is really inherently unjust because it affects most those who created it the least. And that's why we fight for climate justice because of how inherently unjust the climate crisis is. But we're also facing an energy crisis. The, this, the energy system which has created the climate crisis has left 800 million people without a light bulb in their homes. And 600 million of those live in this continent in Africa. 70% of the people in this country and Mozambique do not have access to electricity. Along with the COVID and the, the health crisis, we're also facing an inequality crisis. And this is very pertinent for climate change because we have data showing that the richest 5% of people on this planet have contributed 37% of carbon emissions from that period 1990 to 2015. Of course, we're facing an unemployment and a li livelihoods crisis. People are really struggling to survive. We're facing a biodiversity crisis and also political crises where in so many of our countries, democracy is threatened, the, the systems of democracy are threatened, and our leaders are listening to the polluters and not to us, the people who elected them. So these are all the crises that we need to be thinking about and to be able to address them together, not just focusing on one of them and forgetting about the rest, because that will only make the injustices even deeper. So keeping that in mind, as I said, on the 1st of September, uh, three weeks ago, we have released this Just Recovery Renewable Energy Plan for Africa. It's Friends of the Earth Africa that has released this. It's available in three languages, in English, Portuguese, and French three of the many, many languages on this continent of Africa, many, many, many. These are just three of the colonial languages that we managed to do the report in. So Jesus. I want to tell you about, yes. The slides aren't, aren't moving. Just aren't you know. moving. Okay, I have a backup plan. Give me one second. Okay. All right, so. Perfect. Okay. I they will like keep it. it, I'll keep it in this mode because I realize the slides don't move. Otherwise, I don't know why I will, I will figure it out. Okay, so to tell you a little bit about what is in this report that we released. So what the report shows is that a 100% renewable energy independent Africa is technically and financially feasible. It's possible. So what's missing is the political will. 
And of course, we need to talk about the fact that Africa needs to change its development, its energy and development pathway. We need to end fossil fuels and dirty energy on this continent. We are not the ones that created this crisis yet. As a planet, we are seeing that the entire planet is running out of the atmospheric space to continue to burn fossil fuels. And also fossil fuels not only cause the climate crisis, they devastate people's lives and livelihoods. They bring uh, soil pollution, air pollution, water pollution to our neighborhoods. They're grabbing people's lands. There are many, many reasons to step away from dirty energy and let not any African or global South leader use their people as an excuse to say that our people need energy, so we need to go for fossil fuels. It's a completely rubbish argument. And we are here to say no. We are here to say that we need to change the energy development pathway and we need to end fossil fuels, even though we are not the ones that created the crisis and the global north needs to stop fossil fuels before us and needs to do it right away. But we want to talk about the positive. We want to talk about the fact that we want an energy system on this continent and in the global south and in the entire world that is socially owned, that is democratic, with renewable energy that serves the people. Remember the 800 million people who do not have access to electricity right now. Remember all of those people in every single one of our countries who is living in energy poverty. So we need an energy system that is going to protect biodiversity instead of polluting the soil and the land and the air that's going to strengthen land rights, is going to promote gender justice, and is not going to lead to increased extractivism. So that's why when we talk about the transformation, it really must be based on certain principles. It's not about transformation of the energy source. It's about transformation of the energy system so that we have principles like energy sufficiency. Everyone has enough and no one has too much. Energy sovereignty, energy democracy, energy as a common good, not as a commodity. So, the, so because we talked about the multiple crises and we need to deal with all of those crises, we need to think about these principles in the, in the energy system that we want to see. So this particular uh, plan that we released a few weeks ago looks at modeling from academic Sven Teska. And we're, to, and we're talking about 300 gigawatts of new renewable energy by 2030, which is a target from the African Union, and 2,000 plus gigawatts by 2050. That's based on energy demand, that's based on energy efficiency, efficiency measures. And to just contrast that, in 2016, Africa used 168 gigawatts of energy. So we're talking about filling the gap of all of those 600 million Africans who do not have access to energy, but doing it with renewable energy. The plan models the renewable energy potential in Africa, and it can meet our needs. And not only that, it also has the potential to create job, job growth, and the renewable energy has the potential to create 7 million jobs. That's what the modeling shows us. And there's also an element of gender justice, although gender justice isn't just about representation, it's much more than that. But when you compare the workforce, uh, the, the women in the workforce in the oil and gas sector and in the renewable energy sector, it's much more in the renewable energy sector. So stopping those fossil fuels and going for renewable energy can also help, as we said in the last slide, can also help promote gender justice. So this is, um, we, uh, as Friends of the Earth, we released this report a few years ago. It's called People Power Now Energy Manifesto. And this, these are the demands that I was talking about earlier, that our energy system for the future needs to be not just renewable energy, but needs to be based on the principles of energy sovereignty, energy sufficiency, needs to talk about a just transition for workers, for communities, needs to worry about whose land is going to be used for solar panels or wind farms and are those people involved in the decisions and are those people owning and operating those renewable energy systems or are they just losing access to the land is the is the future energy system going to be more extractivism that's coming from you know the congo or or argentina lithium from argentina rare earth minerals from the congo is that what the future energy system is going to be about and we say no we want 
an energy system that reduces extractivism and and doesn't devalue like is happening right now the the human beings who are currently producing those materials that that go into our devices of the modern era so it's very intentional about not being just transforming the energy source but very much transforming the system and talking about ownership and talking about land use and talking about the materials use and all of these things so going back to the plan, talking about financing really quick. So in, in the Just Recovery Renewable Energy Plan for Africa, and of course the Just Recovery part here is really important also because of the context right now that we are talking about is in this event, which is that COVID has had a major impact on many, many of our countries, on many, many communities and peoples. And to be, to, to be able to to target that is really important. Thanks, Sam. I got that. And uh, it's going to need it's going to need money to have this just recovery renewable energy plan for Africa is going to need money, and it's 130 billion dollars per year. And where does that finance come from? And we have some ideas already. We need to stop tax avoidance, tax evasion, and illicit financial flows. And that image there shows. And this image is from 2014 and it shows $58 billion are lost because of illicit financial flows. And the number, the, the, quoting a number from UNCTAD where we are right now, it's $89 billion that are lost currently. So this is a huge concern and that's one of the ways, stopping those things is one of the ways that, that we can um, have funds to be able to do something like this renewable energy plan for Africa. The other way is to get the finance, of course, rich countries must repay the climate and ecological debt that is owed from the global north to the global south. In this particular case, we're talking about Africa because of the renewable energy plan, but this stands for the entire global south. We can cancel Africa's debt, but continue to hold the leaders, our own leaders as well, who were in, complicit in the debts. And what about an idea like a global pandemic solidarity tax on the wealthiest, because if we need to target inequality to be able to stop the climate crisis, because we saw the numbers. The richest 5% have produced 37% of the emissions. So the money exists. Let us not let anyone tell us that the money doesn't exist but the political will is what we are all fighting for. And so we released this report three weeks ago. And at the same time, we also released a political statement, which captures the main points that I've been talking about here. And that was signed by 50 organizations from across Africa, led by Friends of the Earth Africa, but joined by so many other, so many other organizations. And we will put the link in the chat so that people can access this. And what we've been doing in the three weeks since we released this is to get this document into the hands of our governments in Africa, get it to our regional bodies, to the African Union, to the AMSEN. And we definitely want to continue this con conversation also with, with UNCTAD and really happy to, to be here and have a space to have this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for your presentation. Very um, insightful, but also inspiring. Um, Katie, would you like to, you're our second speaker, would you like to go next? For sure. Uh, I'm also just going to share screen. Can everybody see my slides? Fantastic. So, hi, folks. Really delighted to be here and to share our recent work on securing a just recovery. Up against the threat of the virus, governments around the world have taken extraordinary steps to put their economies on life support and tackle the pandemic. But unfortunately, the unprecedented stimulus packages from wealthy economies is probably leading us towards a great divergence between and within countries, between rich and poor and between North and South. Those who are already doing well are on track to consolidate their supremacy, while for those who were already marginalized by precarious work, low wages, under-resourced public services, patriarchy, racism, and climate impacts, things are getting worse. As an example, COVID-19 has cost workers around the world 
uh, just last year, $3.7 trillion, while the world's billionaires grew their already huge fortunes to a record high of $10.2 trillion just by October last year. At the global level, not all governments were equally able to release these big stimulus packages. While wealthy governments used fiscal firepower to protect their people, huge capital outflows, depreciating currencies and collapsing supply chains generated a tsunami of debt distress across the South. This has meant fiscal tightening at a time when public health services and social safety nets needed robust investment. In fact, 41 developing countries actually reduced their total expenditures in 2020, 33 of which nonetheless saw their public debt to GDP ratios increase. So that's a steady at a time when we needed investment and nevertheless debt increased. At current rates, developing countries will be $12 trillion poorer by 2025 than they would have been without the pandemic. And that's a figure that comes from a report that UNCTAD published two weeks ago, the Trade and Development Report. Furthermore, recovery efforts so far have not been effectively mobilised to bake in the green industrial transformation that will be necessary. No strings attached support has meant that the opportunity to glean a green transition from this crisis has been lost. It goes without saying that one and a half years on from the pandemic start, we are still nowhere near where we need to be to end the pandemic and secure a just recovery. Global vaccine apartheid is leading us towards a perpetual cycle of mutation and reinfection. Economic instability and a lack of fiscal space promises another lost decade for many countries in the South. The unfolding of climate breakdown is accelerating with a summer of deadly disasters across regions and the new IPPC report showing the disastrous gap between rhetoric and reality to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. There's no greater priority than for humanity to tackle these challenges together, yet while some regions are beginning to get back to normal, a cycle of outbreak and instability is promised in the South. And it's widely known that this normal did not bring security and prosperity for the majority of people, even in wealthy regions. Getting back to normal is not the route to a just recovery. The pandemic surfaced critical weaknesses and fundamental failures in this hyper-globalized world that metastasizes inequalities and climate destruction, and now must be the opportunity to address them head on. This means, firstly, addressing vaccine apartheid and debt distress to make sure that everyone can recover from the pandemic and that development is not held back even further. This means supporting the proposed TRIPS waiver on COVID-19 products that has the support of the majority of countries, which would comp and compelling pharmaceutical companies to share their technology and know-how to get production off the ground across regions, not just in advanced economies who've already shown that they will hoard doses or use extreme trade measures to block vaccines getting to the regions in need. While donations help, only breaking the pharmaceutical monopolies to build global public health resilience will get us on a route to a just recovery for public health. BioNTech, Moderna and Pfizer are set to make $130 billion combined by the end of 2022, protecting their intellectual property, which was generated with the support of public money, effectively makes sure that profits are put before lives. Debt distress must mean a better uh, workout system than the ad hoc G20 offer of the Common Framework, which has so far not compelled private creditors to participate. Throughout the pandemic, private creditors, including vulture funds, can, have continued to collect debt repayment. More than 60 countries were spending more on debt servicing than on their health systems before the pandemic even began. But this deadlock will be impossible to get out of while countries face credit downgrades for attempting to secure relief, making access to credit all the harder to achieve. The external debt stocks of developing countries reached $11.3 trillion last year, 250% what it was in 2009. We need a transparent, accountable and multilateral workout process, and the current crisis will require significant debt cancellation to achieve anywhere near sustainability of public finances. Moving forward, we need a new consensus that reasserts the interests of public priorities over private profits, the prosperity of all over the monopolies of the few. This is not going to come, this is not going to be some great reset led by greenwashing corporate giants, but by a reasserted public sector that uses the lessons of the pandemic to invest in a green and just recovery. 
Um, at the national level, we have proposed seven lessons to build back better in the recent uh, UNCTAD TDR. Um, number one, governments are not households, and that means that we must reject austerity. Number two, central banks are public institutions, and their authority should reflect public policy priorities. Um, number three, resilience is a global public good and can only be delivered through public investment, international support and policy coordination. Number four, finance is too important to be left to market, so we need strong regulatory oversight. Um, number five, cutting wages is bad for business and worse for society. Six, a healthy economy needs to be diversified and a green industrial policy is needed for countries at all levels. Um, and number seven, a caring society is a resilient society. Care is the foundation of all of our societies and requires significant investment. But as long as vast asymmetries exist between North and South, this policy programme will be, will be withheld for many. The pandemic has come at a moment when economic, social, political and environmental breakdowns demand urgent, ambitious and coordinated political action across borders. Such action requires new global norms and rules that allow national autonomy while converging broadly together on shared goals. Achieving this new approach requires confronting and contesting those who win out at the current system, the beneficiaries in financialized sectors, monopolies, footloose firms, and their apologists in academic and policy circles. It requires a different prioritization of growth and distributional goals that can deliver rising living standards for the majority of people in all countries without further damaging already fragile ecosystems across the world. This requires the urgent reform of rules and practices at the multilateral level in trade, investment and monetary regimes. And these rules are currently skewed in favour of global financial and corporate interests. A just recovery calls for nothing less than a transformed multilateralism in the shape of a global mission to uphold and advance developmental priorities and ensure economic and climate justice are achieved together. At the GDP Centre and UNCTAD, we've called for a new multilateralism built on five core goals um, that I, I will uh, that, that you can read in that the report, the Geneva Principles, um, and five key principles. Um, from our perspective, um, at its core, this vision is about recalibrating the power asymmetries that sustain and uh, and deepen inequalities and injustices. But if the pandemic has been a test of our willingness to overcome differences and collaborate to tackle existential challenges, we have a long way to go to advance this vision. While we are forced to be optimists, the unrelenting advance of climate change means the urgency of reforming the system has become fiercer than ever. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, we're going to now have Letty. Um, who will be speaking in Spanish um, and we will be doing the translation cap captions afterwards, but it's also good for our, the Spanish speakers who, who are out there as well. So Leti, um, go for it. Sam, yo no sé si estoy logrando hacer la, la, eh, la pantalla. ¿Sabes hemos, qué está pasando? Eh, hemos visto antes. ¿Sí? Sí, sí, estaba funcionando antes. Sí, pero ¿por qué no funciona ahora? Porque no yo sé. paré. Si quieres que... Sí, está funcionando. Sí, está funcionando, pero debería estar total, ¿no? Sí, pero puede ser como hace DPT, como 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Está bien. Está, ¿Están viendo una solo o todas? Uno. ¿Uno? Ah, entonces está bien. Bueno, es que yo nunca hago estas cosas de tecnología. Bueno, me, va me avisando del tiempo, por favor, por WhatsApp. Bien, compas, eh, muy bien estar con ustedes. Eh, bueno, yo hablo español y no me voy a disculpar por eso. Espero que mucha gente me pueda entender. Es un gusto estar acá con ustedes. Yo hago parte de Amigos de la Tierra Internacional, pero hoy voy a hablar eh, de, una, de una alianza 
que me da mucho orgullo de verdad hacer parte, que es la Alianza Feminismo, Feminismo Popular, eh, donde estamos construyendo con Amigos de la Tierra Brasil, eh, Movimiento de los Trabajadores Sin Techo de Brasil y la Marcha Mundial de las Mujeres. Eh, hemos, nos, estamos nos articulando eh, hace, ahora hace más de un año y entonces la alianza es reciente, pero la historia de estos movimientos ya es bastante larga y, y nuestra, nuestra voluntad de estar juntas en esta alianza es básicamente por el tema del evento, por eso que nos invitaron para estar acá con ustedes, es para, para traer una, una visión feminista eh, de, nuestras, de nuestras luchas sobre el contexto que estamos viviendo, ¿no? por una recuperación basada en la justicia en, en todas sus dimensiones. Entonces, eh, no hay como no hacer un poco de, de contexto sobre eso. Y ahí están en nuestras organizaciones eh, y traer este debate sobre la coyuntura excludente y desigual en que vivimos. Entonces, y, y traer una, una mirada feminista sobre este cuadro de, de desigualdad, eh, de exclusión y, y de muerte. Eh, vivimos desde 2016 en un estado de golpe en Brasil. Eh, esto es una cosa que, que hay que traer luz. Entonces la pandemia nos llegó eh, mientras vivíamos un golpe de estado y seguimos en un golpe de estado. Entonces eh, el, el gobierno de Bolsonaro, un gobierno eh, fascista y de ultraderecha, ultra neoliberal, eh, lo, que, lo que está haciendo con nosotros en Brasil es nos volver a traer a estar en el mapa de la hambre. Eh, estos son materiales de comunicación que, que están saliendo a todos los días, que nos trae una, una cara bastante nefasta de lo que el mercado, junto con un gobierno neoliberal, eh, tiene la capacidad de traer a un país. ¿no? Mientras la gente pasa hambre, eh, nuevos billonarios todos los días crecen, ¿no? Entonces acá hay algunos datos que creo que son importantes de tener en cuenta. Eh, Brasil tiene 40 nuevos billonarios, eh, eso es un dato de 2021, eh, mientras más de 116 millones de brasileños, brasileños y brasileñas no tienen comida suficiente o están pasando hambre. Eh, y los récords del sector de agronegocio están aumentando a cada día. Y mientras estamos construyendo eh, nuestras maneras de, 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 una, de traer una recuperación justa basada en la justicia, eh, caminos de solidaridad eh, real entre la clase, traba, clase trabajadora, eh, la, hemos hecho una publicación reciente que aún no está disponible, pero puedo pasar enlaces también, que es esta, la farsa. Eh, de la solidaridad S.A. Eh, salió muchos materiales en los medios de comunicación eh, sobre, sobre esta farsa solidaridad. No, ni se puede llamar de solidaridad, pero fue el nombre que las empresas transnacionales utilizaron para hacer ca caridad, ¿no? Caridad. No sé cómo es el nombre en español, pero es eh, una maquillaje, una nueva maquillaje, ni verde y ni lilás para el feminismo, decimos, ¿no? Ni verde para el ambientalismo, ni lilás para el feminismo, pero eso, las mismas empresas que no que no pagan impuestos, que tienen dívidas enormes, las mismas empresas que están formando nuevos billonarios, ahora hacen un poquito de, de, de caridad, un eslogan publicitario para salir en medios de comunicación. Entonces, eh, en este cuadro estamos en Brasil. Y una de las maneras que más hemos, eh, eh, que estamos nos articulando como Alianza Feminista Popular es la eh, construcción de poder popular y la movilización en las calles, en las redes sociales y con mucha alegría y con mucho orgullo de, de construir junto con el movimiento de los trabajadores sin techo, podemos decir que ayer en Brasil hubo una movilización y el MTST ocupó la bolsa de valores en São Paulo diciendo que en la bolsa de valores están los culpados por la miseria del pueblo y si todo está costoso y si la gente no tiene que comer, no tiene donde vivir, no tiene empleos, es por culpa de Bolsonaro y es por culpa de las empresas que están eh, ganando cada vez más ganancias justamente adentro de esta bolsa de valores en São Paulo. 
Entonces, eh, esta militancia política que está construyendo el poder popular todos los días en las calles, en las ocupaciones de la periferia urbana y el campo, eh, en la periferia de la ciudad, en la periferia del campo, ayer eh, dijo, eh, si todo está costoso, es por culpa del Bolsonaro que está abrazado con las empresas transnacionales, con las instituciones multilaterales. Ya hablé cinco minutos. Bueno, un otro trabajo muy fuerte que hacemos es eh, de construir este poder popular también con las comunidades con quienes trabajamos, que son impactadas por las transnacionales, que sabemos que están en el centro de la arquitectura de la impunidad. Eh, los, los territorios que trabajamos eh, son organizados por los movimientos sociales y están en lucha contra las empresas. Entonces, los trabajos que, vamos, que voy a presentar acá son territorios que son impactados por empresas. Eh, este es un ejemplo de una marcha en la calle por una, eh, por una comunidad impactada por una empresa transnacional alemana, eh, Fraport, una empresa alemana, y el pueblo lleva una, una, una placa diciendo la empresa alemana viene a violar los derechos del pueblo en Nazaret. Eh, es una marcha y el pueblo sigue, son más de 5.000 familias desajochadas de sus comunidades donde vivían por más de 40 años y todavía sin sus derechos garantizados y seguimos en lucha. Nuestras movilizaciones e incidencias eh, están articuladas eh, con la región latinoamericana en envíos de acciones globales. Entonces acá está un día de movilización latinoamericana con la jornada continental por la democracia y contra el neoliberalismo el día 8 de marzo. Acá está un video que hicimos y movilización donde la alianza estuvo activa eh, en las calles, en solidaridad por la, el día de acción, eh, el día, día 24 de abril, en lucha contra las transnacionales. Eh, esta es una acción de solidaridad. Hacemos muchas relaciones entre los sindicatos eh, de los trabajadores, eh, sindicatos de, de la clase trabajadora con donaciones para las comunidades donde trabajamos en la, en la periferia. Esta solidaridad de clase real, ¿no? quien está hombro a hombro con el pueblo, es, es muy, muy verdadera y, y acontece muchísimo. Otra, otra acción que, que sigue aconteciendo mucho son eh, acciones en las ferias agroecológicas. Eh, Porto Alegre, donde vivimos, hay la, una de las mayores ferias agroecológicas de Latinoamérica eh, y los agricultores eh, agroecológicos tienen, y campesinos y campesinas, eh, todo lo que no, no, no se vende eh, se dona para las cocinas comunitarias eh, de la periferia urbana, entonces se, se convierte para donaciones para las cocinas comunitarias y se transforma en comida para el pueblo. Y este es nuestro nuevo orgullo, eh, que es una, relación de, 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 una nueva relación de economía posible, la alianza camponesa y operaria por la soberanía alimentaria, eh, donde se está logrando hacer el arroz eh, del MTST eh, con el movimiento de los pequeños agricultores de la vía campesina eh, para apoyar a las cocinas solidarias eh, del movimiento, donde la alianza también eh, tiene una relación importante de solidaridad. Hacemos muchos talleres para fortalecer la cocina comunitaria y, las, y ahora la cocina solidaria que en la próxima semana ya vamos a tener. Eh, estamos fortaleciendo la construcción de hortas comunitarias también para que se pueda fortalecer esta relación de pertenecimiento eh, con, con el territorio, los territorios. Hay más fotos y ya voy a acabar, Sam. Eh, son algunos territorios con quienes trabajamos, donde este tejido social también es posible eh, fortalecer, ¿no? Y bueno, nuestra visión es que el feminismo popular es para mudar el mundo, cambiar el mundo y cambiar la vida de las mujeres en un único movimiento. Entonces, muchas gracias. Y, y bueno, estoy acá para, para seguir charlando y seguir conversando. Gracias. Thank you so much, Eddie, for that very interesting presentation. And also to all our speakers, I think we... When we talk about the just recovery, it's really happening at so many different levels. Uh, and I think the three speakers gave really 
um, interesting and inspiring examples with Katie much more at the, at the global and the policy level and also from an institutional perspective like UNCTAD, uh, Dipti at the African regional level and and the role that I think addressing both the COVID pandemic inequality and climate change in that very um, yeah, inspiring um, new report uh, and plan launched by Friends of the Earth Africa together with organizations. And then Letty's uh, presentation on the real local work at the grassroots level, how we build this just recovery and people's power with, together with social movements and also, I think the incredible acts of solidarity that we've seen happen all around the world um, in terms of how we respond to this crisis. And, and that's happened where I'm from here in Australia, in terms of um, people sharing food, people delivering food to those in need and the real, the real role of, of food um, in providing people's basic need, but also the need to transform the, the food system towards something that's, that's both ecological and, and owned by people. Um, now, just to, to finish off, I had one question for all of the panelists who probably, um, yeah, just a few minutes, two minutes, I'll let you know when we've been speaking for two minutes, um, but it can be less. And, and the question is, um, how do we, like, it could be one or two, but um, how do we do just recovery and, and what inspires you that we can potentially win a just recovery? And I'll, I'll start with you, Dipti. So, el, la pregunta Leti estaba, um, ¿cómo construimos el recu recuperación justa y qué es algo inspirador que podemos ganar para ti? So, vamos a comenzar con Dipti. Dipti. It's a great question, Sam. Um, we need a just recovery. We just absolutely need it for all of the crises that this planet is facing and all of the injustice that people are facing on their body. It's just, it's, it's something that we need to build towards. And we need to, the reason we need to look at all of the crises together is that we actually need to tackle them together and to not have a situation where a so-called solution to one of the crises is actually making it much worse on the other front. So that's why we, we fight against false solutions, carbon markets, geoengineering, carbon trading, because those are things guaranteed to make the other crises even worse and deepen the injustices. So what is it that makes me think that we can have a just recovery? It's, it's the humanity of all of us. We need to centralize life in, in our systems going forward. And, and when we, when we relate to each other as as humans we just cannot allow such injustice and such inequality to continue to be so pervasive and in southern africa we have a really beautiful bantu concept which is ubuntu which is i am because we are and if we have that sense of that value system, that interconnectedness of humanity and centralizing life and looking at care work, you know, we haven't mentioned that yet, even in, in some of the things that Leti was saying, it's so clear. Those are the values that we need to see in the world that we build. And if we build that world, if we do our work with that in mind, I think that's what can help move us towards a just recovery. And that's what inspires me, that we're looking for this not just a change of system, not just a change of energy source, but a change of system, not just a change of system, but a change of value system and to bring these really human values into our work and into our future. And that's what inspires me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dipti. Katie, if you have any reflections on yeah, how, we, how we build a just recovery um, and some of the concepts the principles in, in your paragraph, in your paper, or um, things that inspire you that will win? Thanks. Um, I think that's a really hard question. I, I because it, it forces you to, um, to be honest with yourself about the things that you're not hopeful about too. But I mean, how do we build a just recovery? I think what Dipti was saying about um, recognizing the way that these issues are interlocking um, they are not separate fights, but they are one systemic challenge. And I think that that goes not just across the, the different um, 
you know, maybe starting points that someone might come into um, working towards a just recovery, whether that's the feminist movement, the climate movement, but, you know, seeing these things as together, but also at different levels, at the local level, the national level and the global level. And I think that, you know, it remains a great challenge to, to you know, both unite across and within borders um, because of the existence of borders and the persistence of colonialism and imperialism in the global governance uh, realm uh, and it, where, where, you know, democracy and, and, and action has been depleted in favour of, you know, supporting global finances access into deeper, ever deeper parts of our lives. Um, so, I mean, I think that we build by working together, by re rejecting those divisions, uh, whether that's geographical or, you know, issue based. And, you know, like, like that you were saying, you don't accept trade offs. You know, there are many visions uh, that we could certainly, for example, with the existential question of climate change, there are many potential routes towards a zero carbon future, not all of which um, uphold rights. And that means, you know, being, uh, you know, focusing on the fact that, you know, endless extraction of, of crucial minerals will not be a just recovery either. Um, so yeah, no trade-offs either. Um, and what inspires me? Um, I think the, the, the international solidarity work that has been going on around, um, vaccine apartheid, I think is, is one of the most crucial questions uh, of just recovery because it, it's almost like a like a like a, a, a microcosm of the bigger issues. We have these trade rules which prevent um, that which put profits first and prevent and withhold um, global equitable access. And the reason we are uh, in the, the weakened position without resilience that we are is because that these pharmaceutical monopolies have, have prevented the sort of building and manufacturing of vaccines in different parts of the world. And I think that this is like, it brings together the public health, it brings together, you know, um, caring care workers and in, in their different dimensions, it brings together the, the, the asymmetries between north and south, between rich and poor. And it also brings in that economic question of industry and being able to create jobs and be self-sufficient rather than a sort of charity-based focus. It focuses on justice. Um, but I mean, aside from that, when I think about what gives me, what inspires me and gives me hope for just recovery, I would say the activism of young people and those people, you know, facing um, fascism and imperialism in their everyday lives, um, you know, like Letty was explaining around, you know, the incredible activism in, in against Bolsonaro. Um, and I think that, that that has to be uh, where the starting point and the end point. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Katie. Uh, Letty? So, la, la pregunta fue um, algo inspirador que podemos, o algo que, que se te inspira para, para que podamos seguir o ganar el, este, esta lucha por la recuperación justa o como, y también como conseguimos este, este poder para ganar o para, para, para continuar. Sí. Eh, bueno, muchas cosas me inspiran. Eh, eh, en, en Amigos de la Tierra Internacional estamos en lucha por un tratado vinculante. Eh, para, para acabar con la impunidad de las empresas transnacionales, ¿no? Y en ese espacio internacional eh, lo que más aprendí es que no hay parte donde las empresas transnacionales no están y, que, y donde no están violando derechos, ¿no? Entonces, eh, esta realidad es, es de verdad que es muy dura, pero también se aprende que donde ellos están hay resistencia y hay esperanza, ¿no? No se puede perder esto. Entonces, yo creo que lo que más me inspira y, y en la alianza, hablando de la alianza, eh, últimamente es esta construcción eh, del poder popular, de la gente entender que las empresas sí están en el centro de la, de la impunidad y la ocupación de ayer en el centro de la bolsa de valores fue una cosa, el pueblo ahí adentro y diciendo, ustedes tienen... tienen eh, si acá está la bolsa de valores, eh, nuestra bolsa está vacía de comida y ustedes son los culpables. Eh, son, son 
pasos muy importantes en la construcción del imaginario del pueblo para entender eh, cómo avanzar en la lucha por derechos. Eh, es eso, ¿no? Cuando, cuando el pueblo salió en las calles diciendo esta empresa transnacional alemana, Frapor, está violando nuestros derechos. Esta está violando nuestros derechos. O sea, hay una participación del poder público acá, pero estos también están copitados, están copitando nuestra democracia. Hay un sistema eh, capitalista que están violando nuestros derechos. Eh, es educación, ¿no? Es una educación popular que se construye día a día, hombro a hombro con el pueblo. Y, y además de esto, esta alianza camponesa y operaria, ¿qué es eso, no? Es cortar eh, las transnacionales del agronegocio, es cortar el, los mercados, eh, los grandes mercados, es eh, fortalecer quien está en lucha en el campo y también está siendo impactado por el agronegocio con muchas violaciones de derechos y quien está pasando hambre en la, en, la, en la ciudad, en la periferia de la ciudad. Entonces es cortar camino, fortalecer relaciones, eh, una, una otra economía, eh, una otra relación y fortalecer eh, 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 es la alianza camponesa operaria y hay una, una música que se canta en Brasil hace mucho tiempo que es cuando, cuando el campo y la ciudad se unir la burguesía no va a resistir entonces eh, estas cosas me inspiran estas cosas me inspiran para decir que si va a existir una recuperación justa va a ser con nosotros y nosotras y nosotras entonces es este el camino que, que estamos construyendo ya ¿no? Eh, por medio de la resistencia en las calles, en las redes, por medio de las relaciones más justas eh, de, de, de comercio, ¿no? por medio de, de la soberanía alimentar, eh, por, por medio de estas relaciones también, y, y construyendo otras vías para revertir el golpe de Estado que todavía eh, seguimos, si, sigue, ¿no? y derrotar el bolsonarismo que vamos a derrotar. Eso... Sí, sí o sí vamos a derrotar. Entonces, eh, creo que ese es el camino y, y no perder la esperanza. Gracias, Leti. Y um, thanks, thanks for all of you um, for your really insightful and, and inspiring talks. And I think um, if I were to answer that question, I feel like, um, you know, this sort of action at the regional level and the local level is, um, is together, but also can our power um, recovery and, and the issue of um, vaccine equity and a people's vaccine is, is really central and here in Australia we recently have succeeded in moving the government um, to support the waiver. Um, it's been a campaign against a, quite a right-wing government that was very skeptical uh, of the waiver and I think through working together through a strong alliance with church-based organisation, doctors, unionists, environmentalists, Uh, we were able to move the government's position just before the recent negotiations. Um, and yeah, I think it's a, it's a very inspiring story of what, of what people coming together can do. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we can, by the end of the year, um, have, a, have a waiver on, on the COVID vaccine and really have much more equity in terms of that. I think it's a, it's a key pillar. So thank you so much to our speakers, particularly Letty for joining at the, at the last minute um, from another Global South who couldn't make it for your um, time and to everyone watching and uh, I think we will leave it there and I think I just yeah we will leave it there. Thanks Sam, thanks everybody. I will just leave the meeting, I feel like that's how we stop it but no <laughs> <laughs> I think we're still live on the stream so bye.